we will be live in another one minute siddharth we are all set will be live in another uh, one minute okay i'll hand over to you because ravi is not here i'll hand over to you and you start please right. okay Good evening, Altaf sir. Good evening, sir. Hi, Manish. Good evening, sir. Sadat sir. Good evening. So, good evening to all. We are live now. Good evening from Arthur TV in Assam, India. Today we have uh, another uh, series of cutting edge webinar from Assam, India. Now I request uh, our moderator, Dr. Siddharth Sharma, to start the webinar. Thank you, Shamsul, and a very, very good evening to all of our listeners. Today we have two very, very experienced speakers joining me from Kashmir, Barzula, is uh, Professor Altaf Kavusa. You've heard of the magician from Kurgan. i like to call him the magician from barzula he has a tremendous amount of experience in limb lengthening and deformity correction he has published several papers on the subject and whenever we have any go to problem for elizra so he has been my teacher he is also the teacher of teachers so professor altaf kavusa will be speaking today on elizra for proximal tibial fractures and another very very experienced speaker today joining us all the way from the united states of america maryland baltimore my good friend dr michael asiag who is a consultant orthopedics and specialist in limb deformity and limb lengthening from the sinai hospital of baltimore the international center of limb lengthening dr michael asiag a fantastic limb lengthening and deformity correction surgeon he works with dr john herzenberg and for those of you who have attended the baltimore limb deformity course he is one of the key faculty members of the limb deformity course out there so it is my pleasure indeed to present to you two very very experienced speakers michael will be talking today to us about special considerations during internal lengthening of the tibia now mind you this is something which we do not see in india very often so guys watch out the space we are going to have two fantastic talks So for the first talk may I invite professor Altaf Kavusa to present his talk over to you sir thank you thank you dr sudha for your lovely words kind words though very big words so it's so nice of you going directly to the presentation i'm sharing my screen i think this screen is available to you all so plateau fractures are a very important applications of lizard technique a wonderful technique for these fractures these difficult fractures so we all know tibial plateau or tibial condylar fractures involve a major weight bearing joint these are serious injuries that frequently result in functional impairment caused by high energy trauma and they cause severe bone decomposition and considerable soft tissue insolence usually associated with articular depression condylar displacement many a times with open wounds or they could have extensive closed degloving so which ones are difficult to manage different classifications initial classifications hall mur and schatzker 
We all know that these groups could easily be managed by conventional methods. But the ones that are really difficult, that's the Shah's group five or six fractures, is they have high cognition, they have they are high energy trauma, and they have extensive soft tissue damage as well, maybe associated with compartment syndrome as well. So they need immediate attention. If we take into consideration the AO classification, I think these are the ones that are the difficult ones. These are the type C fractures. They could be minimally or undisplaced, and they could have the intraarticular extensions, and then with associated articular comminution. These make these fractures very complex because you need to get the articular congruence, then you need to manage the soft tissues for an excellent outcome. Then this is also important to consider the three uh, column classification. You could have, this is based on the CT scan. You could consider the medial column, the lateral column, and the posterior column. And similarly, this is very important to know if you need to approach these fractures. Lateral column would be from the anterolateral approach, medial from the midline or the medial approach. The posterior columns, posterior medial approach, or the lateral part would be dealt with a reverse L-shaped incision. And then briefly, what leads to these kind of injuries is this: if you have the medial column, it's usually the varus plus extension. The lateral one, it's valgus and extension. And these usually happen with a severe flexion. So if you go to the type five and type six Schatzker and AOC group, these may involve all the three columns. And these are, these are the ones that are usually dealt with Elizabeth technique. So as we all know, the mainstay of treatment has been open reduction and internal fixation, but there are certain concerns of open reduction and internal fixation, like you could have problems with the skin, deep infection, very common with these, then problems related to the implant, malalignments, not unheard of, though you are doing open reduction in dental fixation. These do happen sometime. And then range of motion around the knees, especially a concern dealing with these type of complex fractures, especially in this part of the world where people use cross leg postures or people have, people have, uh, uh, we have deflection, knee deflection. So range of motion is especially important in this part of the world. So what are the problems with open reduction and internal fixation, especially with the double plating? So if we go through the initial literature, there has been a 23% rate of infection associated with these uh, fractures. Another study in 92, is reflecting that infection complicating four out of five bicondylar fractures. Another study showing deep infection with seven out of eight. Another study, 30% infection rate. And if we go to the later research also, the rates of infections are continuing. Though this shouldn't be happening that once you are open reducing, there shouldn't be uh, malunions, but they do occur. There are also non-unions. And if you go through this study, there are, there are of flexion contraction as well. So another research in 2007, 29 cases of high energy tibial trauma, tibial plateau fractures, 17% deep infection. Relatively recent study, Again, infection complications, 20%, then hardware-related complications. And in seven patients, malalignment was also observed. Again, another study, knee stiffness, malalignments, and difficulties with the wound. So with this background, one would always think that, is there any alternative treatment? We would like to have an ideal treatment. But the ideal treatment would mean that that would be minimally invasive. 
which would restore the articular surface and would be soft to the soft tissues and preserve range of motion around knee. And there should be no non-unions or any malunions. And perhaps I think this is the technique which would perhaps provide all of these. So before thinking of doing laser out technique, one has to have a meticulous planning because it's the exact planning and then excellent execution and the brilliant follow-up that actually leads to the excellent results with this minimally invasive technique. So if you go with the radiology first, this innocuous looking uh, X-ray is actually revealed by the CT scan that actually shows you where is the combination, which are the fragments, uh, uh, which are the fragments in which columns, whichever column they are. And then one needs to understand by these that where one is gonna fix them and which fragments are to be fixed from where. So this is, for example, here one wouldn't dream that there would be any depressions, but, but of getting a CT scan, you actually come to know there are regional areas of depression which need to be addressed to get exact congruence. And this is a frequent association, a coronal split. So this also needs to be addressed for an optimum result. So once we are planning with a CT scan, one needs to know if you have big fragments, we prefer to have a fixation, internal fixation there also. And then we can plan our lives accordingly. So this fragment, this fragment, and the fragments. And if you have big fragments without combination, we prefer to use cannulated screws for compression and that give a long stability to these fractures. Then, like I said before, that one got to take care of these coronal splits. So usually use traction table. Many, if not most fragments fall in place. Then you try to do indirect methods. By indirect methods, you would use joysticks using shank screws or Stenman pins to lift any depressions. Then once the depressions are lifted, then you concentrate on any local depressions. Then we try to elevate that. After that, you plan fixations by contracting uh, all lives. Then we could have hybrid modifications. That it's not necessary to rest it to the use of wires. We could use interfragmentary screws for larger fragments then fragment specific incisions to lift the fragments. So once you have seen in the CT scan, actual site of the depressions, you like you have in the pre-op decisions that where you would be lifting, where you would be putting an incision to lift that small fragment. And if you have a big crater, you might need to fill in the dead space. Then mixed ring and a rod fixation could be used to reduce the bulk of the fixator. So I'll be sharing our past experience. So we, have, we started it in the past two decades with conventional laser out technique or with hybrid modification. Actually, we have around more than 110 cases done in these two decades. And we specifically followed in few last uh, years these 35 cases of type C fractures with an objective assessment to actually give an evidence-based results for us. So we chose these C1 and C2 fractures, which could be minimally displaced or displaced one. The actual CT scan would reveal the actual degree of combination, depressions, like here, C2 fracture. This is immediate fixation, the contract acting on lives. They give adequate compression and an alive through the proximal head of fibula. This acts as a buttress for the lateral condyle. And this is that one year's follow-up. Now that you have no metal inside, 
your axis is restored optimally and the post slope as well. This is the function. This is what we need. Our people would love to have this posture. They want, they want to have extreme degrees of flexion and they don't want to have any compromise on the range of motion of knee. Now, one of the important aspects is this is a very effective technique in dealing with bad soft tissue and with bad cognition as well. So this is again type, five, type six, let's see anterior fragment totally rotated and proximal combination in the fibula as well as tibia. This is the condition of the skin. One would always love to do something externally rather than going inside. Then assessing the CT scan, there is good amount of combination everywhere. So this is fixation of the ligamentous axis traction on the fracture table. We frequently use these interfragmentary screws because these remain there once we remove the fixator, once the, remove, uh, the fixator has done its job. So this prevents any further uh, depression in the fragments and this uh, in the post-op uh, period. Again, a brilliant range of motion. Again, so this is both a deadly combination, bad combination, as well as a bad skin. Studying the CT scan, this fair amount of combination, depression, all aspects, and a metaphysical disruption. And if you study, you see the separate fragments. So here one thing whether these things could be really managed, but then if you use the joist uh, technique and then if you have evaluated these fractures very well to begin with, you may very well succeed in doing a close reduction with these things, with joistings. So on a traction table, then passing contracting our lives. So this is to hold the fragment, this alive, the use of alive on either side. We usually go with three rings only. And I rarely use a trans uh, you know, joint, about the joint, I don't usually use it because I try to do maximum fixation. And when I'm uh, comfortable that it's very stable, then I never go across the joint. Only in cases where I feel that there is associated ligament injury of the joint, which would need some kind of a stabilization or some kind of a restriction of motion for some time, then only I go across the joint. So this is that nine months follow, fair restoration of the congruence and excellent union. Again, such a bad soft tissue. Sorry. And again, type six fracture. Assessing the CD scan, reduction and use of hybrid technique, contracting lives. This is the result at one year. The reasonable restoration of alignment in both planes, an excellent range of motion. Now, you see, you have now severe combination as well as depression. So it's kind of a bag of bones. So in both planes, one can judge how many fragments are there. And then if one tries to really open reduce them, it's hardly possible, I think, to restore this congruence at, at the same time trying to preserve the soft tissues. So if one is able to manage these percutaneously with closed and indirect methods, that re the results are definitely better than open reduction. Again, after you study the CT scans, try to see why you have to lift and the gaps created needed here, the gap created needed some direct bone graft as well. Again, the use of olives. And this is the result. So there is, this is 83 exposed, I suppose 78 degrees of virus healing. But again, with a good function. Then 
many a times you have patients with comorbidities and osteoporosis. So this is a 52 years old lady with diabetes and osteoporosis. And severe combination, severe depression. And on top of this, not a good skin as well. So we try to restore this again with the Lizero technique. So here one is in a fix whether should you accept some kind of incongruence and have a good function rather than try to go inside in a bad skin and have maybe a better reduction, but perhaps not a better uh, function. So this is at the end of one year, not that great congruence on the left side. What was important here that she continued to have a great function. So this would be always a debatable issue that sometimes if you are not able to restore to the 100% level of congruence, should one be thinking about these things or open reduction, but at the same time, be not certain about the functional outcome. Now, if you have relatively undisplaced fractures, then you could decrease the bulk by using a hybrid modification, proximally use the ring so that you have a circumferential ability to fix the fracture on all sides. At the same time, try to reduce by distally using the half pins only over a uniplanar fixator. So you have, again have brilliant results, you have excellent congruence, and at the same time, achieving fun, good function. And then if one would see really as what happens at the long term, such a bad fracture, this I think was uh, dealt with 15 years back. At the same time, internal fixation as well as ring fixation was performed. And this is the result at 15 years, continues to have excellent function and a reasonable alignment. So we published recently our results with uh, 35 fractures, which I said that we planned few years back to have an objective assessment. This is recently in this March, this is published in Malaysian Orthopedic Journal. So if we took all these 35 patients, all except one fracture united in time, and the average time to union was 15 weeks in type five and around 17 weeks in type six, and average external fixation was 15 weeks in case of type five and 17 weeks in type six fractures. And this is the beauty of the procedure is that we had an average range of motion around 130 degrees. There were no deep infections, no cases of stiffness. We objectively assessed meticulously with this radiological assessment, Ramson's radiological score to give an objective assessment that whether we are able to restore the proximal tibial fracture anatomy. So if we, if we saw that preoperative depression was seen in 74% with one to nine millimeter, which reduced to 22% uh, and that to only one to four millimeters. Then radiologically, we had excellent results in 24, good in 20, 10 cases, and there was only one poor result. The mean radiological score was 8.37. And then, as usual, pain tracks do bother you, but many, most of the times, they are superficial ones, and they are dealt with easily by pressings and, in some cases, with uh, use of antibiotics. Then there are certain difficulties in external fixation. People sometimes may be bothered about the compulsive nature of the rings. So in order to reduce the time of external fixation, one could shift to brace, brace treatment and brace uh, immobilization. If you felt that the fracture is starting healing, that you might earlier shift to the brace or you could use the hybrid external fixation. We did have one case of delayed union that was managed by bone marrow injection. There were three cases with extensional lag of less than 10 degrees. So if you go by literature, this is JBJS 2009. So this was a study comparing this ORF with tibial fractures, you know, this, uh, sorry, with the Elizabeth technique. Then the conclusion was that circular fixator group has less intraoperative blood loss, spend less time in hospital, and 
the patients in uh, the ring group have superior early outcome in terms of hospital for special surgery scores at six months and the ability to return to pre-injury uh, pre activities at six months. So what are the practical tips? The most important thing is plan and plan well. Do not accept non-Congress reduction, but try to use indirect methods of reduction. And if you fail to have indirect reduction, do not hesitate to perform fragment-specific minimal open reduction. Use screws wherever, wherever deemed possible to hold big, big fragments. This goes in a long way to prevent any uh, malalignments while you are uh, having union of the fracture. Do not be tempted to early remove a fixator and never get fed up by any malalignments. You may be able to rectify it. That's the beauty of it. Many of times you see that there is medial uh, depression on the medial side by early weight bearing. So if you felt that there is some kind of depression or malalignment that can be dealt with in the post-op uh, period also. And always watch for medial collapse. That's what I earlier said. So the take-home message would be that given the nature of these fractures, we have very high rates of deep infection and other problems associated with ORF, to no infection and excellent range of motion with the use of laser technique, it could be considered as the preferable treatment for such difficult injuries. These advantages perhaps outweigh the difficulties of an excellent physician. Thank you very much for your attention. Right, stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Professor Altaf, for that uh, very nice lecture. And uh, the lecture is now open to comments and questions. So one of the questions that uh, I would start by asking you, uh, Professor Altaf, because a lot of people will do, I mean, 80, 90% of the people would do internal fixation. So they would, so even if you argue that these people have poor skin condition, you have the span, scan and plan. So you wait for two or three weeks for the swelling to subside and then do a CT scan and then do a fragment specific fixation. So what is your reply to those people who say that internal fixation should be done in each and every case? I mean, why Elizra? Because why I said, because I think in these fractures, it's, it's mostly the soft tissue envelope. I will score it more than the fra fracture itself. Is the soft tissue envelope. And if you are going to restore the anatomy by open reduction, you got to have a good amount of dissection. And then if you are using a bicondylar fracture, you might need a couple of different incisions. And if you try to fix the, post, uh, the coronal secret as well, the soft tissue dissection is low. So there is not much of a soft tissue preservation. So I will always go for a method that would we have to have minimal soft tissue disruption. And then important is if you have really very bad fractures that which are not salvageable, if you put in too much of metal in there, tomorrow if you have to convert it into a replacement, that time also a uh, lack of metal would be, would be better than having too much of metal around. That's my take on that. That if one is able to definitely manage with closed things, that will always be preferable. And if you look at the, like the studies I showed, I showed you so many, many studies, and there are a lot many more that still continue to have the infections and the problems with hardware. Why would one like to do something which can be done in a closed method? That's okay, my let, let, let me try try this another way because uh, there are still people who believe in internal fixation. So are there any cases in your experience where you would not do Elizrao and you would prefer internal fixation? So I would like to hear from you what are your indications oh, for doing yes, internal that's, fixation? As, as I said earlier, the fix the fragments, the the classifications one, two, three, four. I wouldn't think of Elizabeth. You have very easy, easier methods. It's only the five and six which make things very difficult for uh, double plating. Whatever best you do, you still would have some chances of having problems. These are the ones that I would like to do. I would not straight away go for those fractures that are easily manageable by internal fixation and with, with minimal sections. Like if we have a type five which is undisplaced, 
it could go either way. Maybe because even in that case, you simply have a traction table, fix it externally, and the fixative will remain there for six to eight weeks, go towards a brace. And I don't think uh, it should have any difficulty. And then, of course, it's the experience, planning, and execution of Lizro technique. That makes it uh, important. Uh, and a uh, person who is good at doing internal fixation, preferably might continue with his method. But if we think from the patient's perspective, then I think uh, minimally in ways you would score higher on that rate. Thank not you. convinced. So, this is not convinced. Uh, I would like to hear what Michael has to say because yes, these are very different setups. And Michael, two questions to you. So what are your general thoughts on Elizrao in uh, you know, table plateau fractures? And secondly, in your practice, do you ever do Elizrao fixation or ring fixations for these fractures? Thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Sharma. Well, first of all, Professor Altaf, your presentation was spot on, very enlightening, very interesting. And to give you my perspective, I come from a school of thoughts that an AO school of thoughts, basically that internal fixation is, is good for everything, right? The truth is a poor soft tissue envelope a lot of comminution, severe swelling, the studies show it. The, those problems lead to a high rate of wound dehiscence, exposed hardware, deep infection, malalignment. Um, you'd be surprised the amount of Schatzker 6 uh, treated with internal fixation who walk into my office with severe valgus malalignment, both from intraarticular depression and, and extraarticular um, uh, malunion. So the first few years of my practice, I used to treat these, these um, Shatsker 5 and 6 with internal fixation with, let's face it, horrible results, horrible results. And I was tired of those 40% wound dehiscence, 30% wound dehiscence and infection and reoperation for washouts, delayed, you, delayed closure. So I started treating my Shatsker 5 and Shatsker 6 with circular external fixation and minimally invasive percutaneous uh, elevation of the surface of the depression, uh, raft screws, cannulated raft screws for the, uh, the articular surface as well. And either a six axis external fixator or a neolizor plastic external fixator. Since then out of about 10 cases, I've had no deep infection, no wound dehiscence, very satisfactory function with the price to pay of discomfort with an external fixer anywhere between three and six months. I will tell you that, and I don't have the, the, the scores out yet. I do not have the, uh, the, the outcomes on the data on paper yet, but I will tell you that the patients are much more satisfied with the external fixation than the internal fixation. So I think the take home message of my long circumvoluted intervention is that there is a role for internal fixation in simpler tibial plateau fractures with uh, a good soft tissue envelope. And there is a role for external fixation with the high comminution, poor soft tissue envelope, severe swelling, or even elderly people who need to bear weight quickly. So that's my take on it. As an orthopedic surgeon, we need to have multiple tools in our toolbox and apply them accordingly. Yes, so Sid, I think you must be feeling comfortable with this. Yes, Michael so has I'm, tested both. I'm very happy to. I'm very happy to hear your thoughts, Michael, because uh, people who do internal fixation will, will will very often not talk about the soft tissue complications or the malalignments. Uh, so most of the times it's hunky dory. Uh, but yes, the another important thing here is like both of you are so experienced surgeons. And both of you have told us about the problem. So I think the another message for the general orthopedic surgeon is that guys, that these are very tough injuries. If you do not have the experience of managing them, you know, try and learn about them. Try and scrub in with an experienced surgeon, whether you're doing internal fixation or the circular external fixator. This is not a fracture that you want to mess around with. This is not something that you want to do as your first or the second case. So get the experience, 
all techniques work well if you have the experience and even with experience you may have some problems so with that uh, we do we have any more questions uh, from so other man. faculty members yes yes manish please uh, sir uh, through you i would like to put across a question to uh, professor altaf firstly sir thank you so much uh, a very enlightening talk uh, we have heard from you in the past also and uh, on the similar lines so sir there were two questions which i wanted to ask you sir one is if you have a massive degloving at or around the proximal tibia maybe extending till a little down below uh, what is your protocol how do do you get the plastic surgeon um uh, in the situation and uh, how do you plan or if if you do if you get the plastic surgeon for covering the wound then how do you plan your uh, fixator some tips i would like to know sir one is that and the other small question is sir many a times recently i have fixed a very uh, severely comminuted proximal tibia schatzker 6 with uh, a circular fixator wherein i finally you know after fixing everything sir uh, when i started moving the knee just to check the stability i realized that there is uh, a fragment dead anteriorly uh, okay. with the patellar tendon yeah which was not stable sir and uh, i had to put a screw but i was still not very comfortable because that whole thing was shattered and comminuted i didn't know somehow i could finally manage to put a small two hole um, one third tubular plate because there was some uh, open thing which allowed me to do that so just a few tips on that so these two yeah. things yeah sir. thank you thank you manish for your questions first question was how do you deal with the degloving injury in such a massive comminuted fractures so in such a case what we would prefer that time is that use an elizero uh, this uh, uniplanar fixator in that set in such a way that tomorrow once the plastic surgeon has done his job because ring fixator we usually would it allow a good flaps and other plastic coverings so that time we try to do it with an external fixation and plan it in such a way that tomorrow once you are going to convert those pins you could incorporate within the rings so that's a little bit of planning in that that's what, so i would always prefer that you have a you have a uniplanar fixator till the time that plastic surgeon would take care otherwise it's very difficult for them to deal with it then your second part is yes of course this is many a time is a situation that you have an anterior fragment which is attached with the, uh, this patellar tendon so definitely you would like to have try to have some percutaneous uh, fixation screw fixation for that then if you said like in your case that you had difficulty in holding with the fixator also this uh, screw as well so what you could try try to find out some oblique uh, this olives that would give some fixation with the proximal tibia because you wouldn't be able able to go directly to the uh, anterior posterior direction try to uh, try couple of only wires on that and a screw fixation i think that should do that should man it really helps sir this this thing really helps that that's I... what i said because i don't shy away using internal fixation because sir. it's basically you must like mike said that you must have everything in your toolbox it's not necessary that's why it's not that elizra would give wonders by putting in wires on me unless you got some congruence and if you need if you have a big uh, defect you need to graft it you need to have a spacer in that so it's not going to unnecessarily putting some wires and you have a rafting screw available use that so it is best what you can use in uh, minimal invasive way that is the crux of it thank you sir wonderful thank you, thank you so thank you uh, professor altaf and thank you faculty for your questions and discussion moving on we have dr michael asiak from the sinai hospital of baltimore international center for limb lengthening and he is going to be talking on special considerations for internal tibial lengthening over to you michael thank you so much dr sharma um so as dr sharma mentioned my name is michael asiak I'm one of the uh, limb lengthening and deformity construct construction orthopedic surgeons from Sinai Hospital of Baltimore, the International Center for Limb Lengthening. About 50% of my practice is trauma surgery and about 50% is limb lengthening and and deformity reconstruction. Now, on the flyer, 
it was initially written that I was supposed to talk about limb alignment assessment and the formula reconstruction planning. But then I thought, I'm, I'm talking to the masters of, of limb deformity reconstruction. And I'm talking to people who most likely know more than I do about deformity planning. Uh, so how, why am I saying that? Well, in 2019, I had the honor to be invited by the Sensitivity Institute of Pune uh, to give with my mentor, Dr. John Hertzenberg, the first lower extremity deformity course of Pune. And you can see this is me, this is Dr. Ersenberg, Madeline, and my lovely wife who's also a, an emergency physician and, and, uh, and all our friends from Century Institute, Dr. Parag. And basically by talking to the, uh, to the amazing surgeons there, I realized that the deformity surgery that is being done in India is of a very high caliber. And the surgeons are, are already excellent. So those are topics that you most likely you know, master more than I do. I had the pleasure to see Dr. Uh, Shamsul Hoda, um, a good friend, and uh, I didn't see Dr. Sharma there, but I had the chance to meet Dr. Sharma, uh, who came for two weeks in our center uh, in 2018, 2019, and, and um, I had the pleasure to meet his brilliant mind. Meanwhile, in Baltimore, this is today. It is uh, definitely not springtime yet. You can, you can see there's lots of snow. It's cold. There's a flurry outside of my, uh, of my house. So I'm glad to be here with you talking about deformity reconstruction. So back to special considerations during intramedially tibial lengthening. Um, the, the laser of method, or actually should I say the, the limb lengthening method has greatly evolved in the past century and a half. Uh, since one of the first descriptions of limb lengthening by Dr. Cody Villa in, in Italy, where he performed an osteotomy in a patient with a post-traumatic malunion of the femur, put the patient in, in a traction in a bed and, and just slowly applied traction. We're talking about the 1903. Um, unfortunately, that patient never walked again. And since that day, multiple surgeons have tried to find you know, the best method to, to elongate limbs until uh, Professor Lizarov described the, um, or should I say discovered, the uh, distraction osteogenesis method with circular external fixation, which really revolutionized the world of limb salvage. Now, since then, we really use only the same method, but what has been changing are the tools of the trade from uh, the very rudimentary methods described at the beginning of the, the 20th century to the Elizarov circular fixator to the computerized robo robotized uh, six axis external fixators that we use a lot of in the West and even um, in, in Asia and India with the ortho -soup. Now, the latest and greatest in, the, in limb lengthening are really internal lengthening devices, which uh, have basically improved the comfort of patients undergoing limb salvage, limb lengthening, or bone reconstruction. Whereas the Elizarov external fixer is, is very versatile, allowing not only to lengthen, but to be modified to allow for deformity correction, it allows for weight bearing. And once the bone is healed and the external fixer is removed, there's, as Dr. Altaf mentioned, there's no internal hardware or barely any internal hardware left inside. Um, so the body goes back to this blank canvas. And if the patient requires more surgeries, there's no hardware to be removed. However, um, the psychological burden of wearing an external fixator at least in the Western world, is high. Uh, the pin sites are very nerve wracking for patients. It is cumbersome. And sometimes when we're talking about extended lengthenings, uh, they can require extended wear, sometimes up to nine months, a year, even a year and a half if we talk about bone transport. Um, not only that, it has been reported with external fixations to have fractures through pin sites proximally and distally. Now, intramedullary lengthening device do not have any pin sites. 
uh, everything is is internal and for a, a patient not having this this cage uh, as they describe it around their leg is life-changing now the problem is that it also comes with a set of uh, of drawbacks where most uh, internal lengthening tools nowadays are not weight bearing. Um, they pre present a big challenge to do deformity correction as what you see is what you get. Uh, so the deformity correction needs to be performed prior. Um, and it cannot be done with in kids with open growth plates and you are limited as well by the implant size. So really not as versatile as external fixation. Now, depending on where uh, you are in the world, there are a lot of different um, internal lengthening devices. The very first iterations of them were ratcheting and are still ratcheting nowadays. So they're mechanical nails that have to rotate through the osteotomy to allow the lengthening. They're uncomfortable. Uh, some of them allow weight bearing, but they achieve the role. One of the latest and greatest uh, is the um, the magnetically induced internal lengthening device uh, that allows with, with the use of remote control and a rod that's inside of the leg to expand, but also to collapse, to shorten, which allows not only distraction osteogenesis, but also compression of, of non-unions or even you know, compression of the regenerate to allow it to, uh, to, uh, to bear more weight. Now, no matter what the implant looks like, it is still the same Elizarov method. And like my mentor, Dr. Herzenberg says, limb lengthening with an internal lengthening device is still limb lengthening. So it's submitted to the same types of complications, the same types of risks, and even more, right? Because we're talking about an internal lengthening device that has a very specific mechanism. So we'll go over all these different complications that can occur. Such as, um, such as joint contractures, the same ones that, that, can, be, that can be had with external fixation. Uh, malunion, right? Deformity, uh, inducing a deformity in the tibia uh, during the lengthening. Uh, compartment syndrome, implant breakage. So let's start with the preoperative considerations. It's all about planning. Just like Dr. Altaf mentioned, careful planning is key. And with external fixation, we can span the whole bone. However, with internal fixation, we are dealing with multiple implant sizes. And if as a surgeon, we do not pick the right implant size, we could end up uh, under correcting our, uh, our lengthening. So the shortest nail length that we can use is usually the, defined by the distance from the tip of the nail or the insertion point of the nail to the osteotomy plus the desired amount of lengthening, plus a constant that we usually um, establish at eight centimeters or seven centimeters. And that constant represents the tip of the nail, plus a buffer zone of about five centimeters of, of female portion of the nail, which is the thick part. Uh, and the reason why is because when we're done the, with the lengthening, we want as much of the thick part to remain in the distal fragment as we lengthen. The weak point of internal lengthening devices is a junction between, and I, I hope everyone is seeing my, my cursor here, my mouse. The weak point is the junction between the male and the female portion uh, because it's a change of diameter. So if that change of diameter ends at the end of the lengthening at the flexible regenerate, it's very simple for the implant to break. The, uh, the other important consideration during planning is that uh, an X-ray of the, of the bone in both planes has to be taken to assess for any type of deformity in the bone. Lengthening nails, lengthening the internal lengthening devices are across the board uh, straight. They do not have a curve. They, they can have a Herzog band at the tip, but they do not have a curve, which means that if one is dealing with a, uh, an angled tibia, well, the osteotomy will have to be done. I hope everyone can still hear me. I had a, a, a microphone issue. So the 
if, if the bone has a curvature to it or, or has an angle to it, the osteotomy will have to be done through the curvature to allow for the straight nail to go through the bone and be inserted through the, through the bone. Now, if we talk about approaches, the nail has to be inserted. And like any trauma nail, uh, there's two common methods. The um, hyperflexed position, also often sometimes called the infracatellar position, uh, which can only be used if there's enough knee flexion and if the patellar height is high enough. However, in the case of patella baja or limited knee flexion, it is very difficult to uh, insert the nail through an infrapatellar or a hy hyperflex entry point, and thus a semi-extended position must be used. Um, Superpatellar entry points can only be used with very specific instrumentation. However, uh, parapatellar approaches and, and arthrotomies can be used medially and laterally uh, if flexion is limited to, um, to sublux the patella and then use a semi-extended approach. Mention to your patient, however, that anterior knee pain is very frequent with those implants up to two years uh, due to the entry point. Now, when we talk about intraoperative considerations, they are very similar to the ones we, we have to consider for internal, uh, for external fixation. So if we are dealing with a deformity, such as in this example, a, a genu varum stemming from uh, a malunion of a Chatsker 6 tibial plateau fracture sustained in the past. So we can see the, there's depression of the articular surface, but there's also malunion of the metaphyseal diaphyseal area. Well, if you lengthen the a tibia through the anatomic axis uh, because of a, of a limb, limb shortening, in this case of about three centimeters, one will accentuate the genuvarum deformity by medializing the, uh, the ankle. So as a surgeon using an laser or fixator, it would be very simple to use hinges and to both correct the varus and the length simultaneously for perfect alignment. However, with an internal lengthening nail, one has to plan the deformity correction first by finding the apex of the deformity, by doing performing the osteotomy close to the apex, by performing an acute correction, and inserting the nail in the plane of the, me of the mechanical axis in order not to worsen the, um, the genuvarum. So um, this is done intraoperatively by using a monolateral external fixator or a fixer assisted nailing method where uh, a single pin is inserted proximally at the proximal tibia, a single pin is inserted uh, at the di diaphysis, distal to the predicted tip of the nail, the osteotomy is done first, the alignment is corrected and using either a bovi cord or a, um, an alignment rod through the center of the hip, the center of the ankle, it should pass through the center of the, uh, of the knee. In this case, we decided to have the alignment pass through the medial tibial spine to offload the arthritic portion of the, um, of the lateral tibial plateau and basically load the compartment, the medial compartment that is um, healthier. You can see on the right at the end of correction, at the end of the lengthening, the leg length are even and the mechanical axis goes through the medial tibial spine as planned, which means that we, we carefully lengthened through the mechanical axis and we did not worsen the deformity. So acute deformity correction only can be done with an internal lengthening device. Now what you see is what you get. No adjustment is possible afterwards. No, 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 correction, no correction is possible afterwards. So what you see is what you get. We'll go back on that topic, but it's very important in those situations to increase the latency period more than the, the per preferred seven days in the tibia to allow the body to create a callus as we've disrupted the surgical site, right? Professor Lizarov described um, very carefully not disturbing the, the callus and having a, a well-reduced osteotomy before starting the lengthening. Now, this is not a tibia, but this is an example on your left of a, an acute deformity correction, distal femur and lengthening with only five days of latency period. 
and and this is at six months what one can see that laterally there's a big cyst there's a big void uh, there's really poor bone formation laterally while medially it is it is adequate and this was a failure to um, to increase the latency period on your right different patient with a 14 day latency period where you can see that the and we're talking about the same age of patients 26 year olds for both uh, where the regenerate is much sturdier on the lateral aspect after the deformity correction. Now, we, if we want to prevent deformity, the deformities during lengthening of a, of a, of a tibia with an elisera fixator, we can either input a stress in the ring at the insertion or perform a lengthening, modify the fixator with hinges, and correct the apex anterior deformity or the valgus deformity that is being created naturally due to muscle pull, right? The muscle pull of the hamstrings and of the of the, the patellar tendon. However, with an internal lengthening nail, this is not possible. What you see is what you get. And the natural tendency of the of the tibia is to deform while being lengthened. So blocking screws are key. Blocking screws are key because they create. A, a block, they create a wall on the posterior side of, the, of the, the nail and on the lateral side of the nail to prevent those deformities to occur during lengthening. So when doing an internal lengthening, use blocking screws liberally. I tend to use Steinman pins first, and I use the reamer uh, as a guide to where the nail would land. So, and I put Steinman pins posterior to the path of that, uh, of that nail, and you can see with the insertion of the uh, of the rod, that Steinman pins Steinman pin is stressed. It it resists the deformity. Sometimes it can be a little bit too aggressive. So here's uh, an example of how the, the screw is positioned laterally to prevent valgus, and posterior to prevent apex anterior deformity or poor curvatum during lengthening. On the left, you, one can see a, a tibia lengthening where the, um, the, those principles were not respected. No blocking screws were used and the severe apex anterior deformity of the, of the tibia was created, which le leads to problems with functional outcome with difficulty fully straightening the knee, in this case by about 15 degrees. And this can create a, a lot of strain on the quadricep a lot of, of muscle fatigue, a lot, a lot of muscle tiredness uh, after severe walking. And same thing on the, on the left, uh, the tendency for the, the tibia to drift into valgus when there's no lateral screw uh, position laterally to the neck, to the, uh, the nail. Now there's other intraoperative considerations that where there's not a lot of research on them, uh, but we do to, uh, for patient um, patient um, safety. For example, an anterior compartment fasciotomy to prevent the risk of compartment syndrome. It's really important to do a fibular osteomy and not to forget it uh, during the lengthening. Uh, common perineal nerve release for lengthenings of high magnitude or when associated with a valgus deformity correction, um, when there's scarring overlaying the nerve or if there's been previous radi uh, radiation therapy, that also creates a lot of scarring around the nerve. We want to prevent ankle plantar flexion, equinus contracture during lengthening by doing soft tissue releases, either a gastrocnemius or a gastroxylus recession, depending on the, on the severity of the, of the stiffness of the Achilles tendon or the gastrocnemius aponeurosis. And in certain cases, when there's already barely any dorsiflexion, and I'm thinking of cases of uh, fibular hemimelia. I'm thinking of cases of post-traumatic uh, limb shortening after a pilon fracture. One who may want to consider a calcaneotibial screw to hold the ankle in place with an internal brace during the lengthening. Uh, and this comes very handy when, when using an external uh, a, an internal lengthening device because, well, we don't have the possibility to extend the fixator to the foot to hold the foot in place. So that one screw going from the posterior calcaneus to the tibia comes in very handy. And, it, and that screw avoids the talus. 
usually a very thick screw, such as a 6.5 millimeter or seven millimeter screw to really resist plantar flexion is necessary. One of the main complications, one of the most dreadful post-operative problems with um, tibia lengthening is the same with internal lengthening devices than with external lengthening devices. So compartment syndrome. In the US, it's the number one cause of lawsuits, of litigations. And for that reason, it is really important to keep a close eye on the compartments for the first 24 hours. And in our institution, we do perform prophylactic fasciotomies. Uh, for all the tibial lengthenings that are done uh, in our institution. The latent sheep period we, 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 we covered a few minutes ago, the average latency period would be seven days in, ter in terms of a regular lengthening. However, this has to be extended to 14 and sometimes up to 21 days if uh, there's an acute correction performed with it, if uh, operating on a patient who uh, who doesn't have the same healing capabilities, such as a patient with very sclerotic bone or a bone that has previously been injured. The bone doesn't have the same biology and that the latency period needs to be increased. I tell my patients that the, the, surgery, the surgical portion of the limb lengthening or the tibia lengthening is the easy part. The tough part is post-operative and physical therapy or lack of physical therapy can make or break a successful lengthening. It, there's no doubt in my mind that it's the most important part of the length, lengthening process. Um, it needs to include very aggress aggressive manual therapy uh, with distraction forces at the joint. It needs to increase uh, some form of isometric strengthening and electrical stimulation because unlike uh, external fixation lengthening, with most internal lengthening devices, except certain mechanical nails, do not allow for weight bearing. So muscle wasting, muscle atrophy happen very quickly. So isometric strengthening, strengthening up to the capacity of the nail is necessary throughout. If we want as well to avoid complication that, that's occurring on the left, ankle bracing is necessary. Dr. Daniel Bave, one of the foremost experts in physical therapy for limb lengthening in the world, uh, has published extensively on the topic and has shown that muscle flexibility is a function of time spent in a stretched position. So wearing ankle braces, ankle foot orthoses at night or with active uh, dorsiflexion will really improve the prognosis and decrease the risk of equinus contracture. We also tend to focus a lot on plantar flexion, but uh, sorry, on dorsiflexion of the ankle during tibia lengthening, but plantar flexion is just as important. Failure to, to stretch carefully the, uh, the tibialis anterior will tend to lead to uh, not only um, a lack of plantar flexion, a lack of push off, but also a tendency for the foot to go to drift into varus or inversion, which, uh, which can really be incapac incapacitating for, for patients as they start walking on the side of the foot after the lengthening is done. So, physical therapy, I'm spending a lot of time on it because it is the most important part. If your patient does not have access to a physical therapist easily due to economic reasons or even uh, geographic reasons, then it's really important to provide them with that knowledge before they leave your care, before they leave the hospital, uh, and that uh, one makes sure that they know exactly, they have a list of exercises to do and clear indications on how long to perform them every day, if, if they require help or if they can do them on their own. So this, a patient can do it, their own physical therapy, however, they have to be instructed and educated properly. Follow-up is key. Limb lengthening is still limb lengthening. So very close follow-up. In my practice, we're talking about follow-up bi-weekly uh, because the distraction osteogenesis plan must be fluid. Um, everyone heals differently. So adjusting the speed, the velocity of the lengthening according to bone formation is very important. Uh, allowing 
compression if bone formation is not good enough before distracting again is important, slowing it down. The same is true in uh, when facing joint contractures. If the physical therapy is insufficient and if the bone allows, then the ability to uh, slow down the lengthening to allow the Achilles tendon, to allow the knee to fully extend, the Achilles tendon to stretch is, is the way to go. So the base rate of lengthening for tibia lengthening in an adult should be about 0.75 millimeter per day for the soft tissues to, to be able to adapt for a bone, but this can come down very easily to 0.5 millimeter per day um, if, if need be. Same thing in the face of nerve irritation, numbness, pins and needles, uh, hypoesthesia, allodynia. If, if facing any of those symptoms, lengthening should be slowed down. Same thing, um, and all that is based off of routine radiographs and physical examination. Very careful physical examination every time. Now, we talked about weight bearing. No, if one has to know their implant. One has to know uh, the capacity of the, of the implant. So most magnetic lengthening nails now on the market can only allow up to 70 pounds of weight bearing, which is definitely below the, the, the weight of most patients. Failure to respect those restrictions will lead to failure of the mechanism. As you can see here, the lead screw backing out compared to the other side. It can lead to fracture of the implant through the, the female portion, fracture of the implant through the screws, or even through the junction. Some electrical nails out there available in Europe can only allow for 20 pounds of weight bearing, while some mechanical nails on the market uh, can allow for up to 150 to 200 pounds. So knowing your implant really, really matters. We talked about congenital etiology. Uh, we didn't talk yet about congenital etiology, so let's go uh, over it for a second. This is not for tibial lengthening, but um, it, it depicts the topic very well. We're um, looking at an x-ray of a patient with fibular hemimelia and congenital femoral deficiency with extensive past history and, and uh, instability of the joint. When performing a congenital lengthening with external fixation, we can span the joint, create a hinge, at the hinge point of the knee, span the joint and extend the fixator to the tibia to prevent any dislocation from occurring. But this is not possible when doing an internal lengthening device. So one must assess the, uh, the subluxation of the joint at every visit and, and address it properly. On the x-ray that you have on the left, you can see, and it's very subtle that uh, the medial compartment is opening. The lateral compartment is starting to overlap uh, at the tibiofemoral joint, which means that there is posterior lateral rotatory instability and subluxation. And failure to recognize that will lead to catastrophic complications for this, this patient's function. Um, so, upon, so how do we prevent that? Well, to prevent that, maintaining flexibility and doing physical therapy is, is the first line of prevention. The second line of prevention is to use bracing techniques at night to keep the knee fully extended, to provide a stretch around, uh, along the hamstrings and, and to prevent that from happening. Uh, in surgery, we release the iliotibial band. We also release the intramuscular septum that can create a very uh, strong resisting forces. And But if, if all hell break loose uh, and there is subluxation, then it is necessary to reverse the mechanism to shorten the rod until, as you can see on the left, on, on the right, the, um, the lateral compartment reduces, the medial compartment reduces, the subluxation resolves, and either stop the lengthening, slow down the lengthening, or stabilize the joint via surgical methods, via surgical reconstruction. There is one topic that I, I did not cover and I, I failed to mention it. It's syndesmotic fixation at the top and at the bottom. With external fixation, you have the luxury to insert the tibiofibular wire uh, through the, uh, the proximal syndesmosis and the distal syndesmosis. But with a, uh, an internal lengthening, this is not possible. And thus, uh, let me just go back in time. There you go, syndesmotic fixation. Um, 
then one has to insert a large fragment screw through the tibiofibular joint. Here we use a cannulated technique uh, where a wire is inserted perfectly to this, at the center of the, the tibiofibular joint. And using a cannulated method, uh, the, uh, the senosmosis is drilled. And then we exchange the wire with a solid four or five millimeter oblique screw. And, the, and the screw, that screw has to be quadricortical because if left only in three cortices, there can be a seesaw effect. There can be a levering effect as the fibula is pulled up that can still dislocate or sublux the, the tibiofibular joint. So very important. We insert that screw obliquely as the cross section of the screw will be oblong, will be oval, instead of, of being circular, which theoretically, from a mechanical perspective, strengthens uh, that screw. Now it is very difficult to, to insert that screw obliquely proximally, and you can you can see that the same method is used, but that screw has a has a tendency to bend. So syndesmotic fixation, very important when doing an internal lengthening, uh, because that can create the, one of the worst complications, which is dislocation, subluxation of the of the distal uh, tibiofibular joint at the ankle. So finally, a la one last consideration is that once the lengthening is over, there is still a, a big, you know, implant. So in in the tibia, so implant removal is key. Um, I tend to quote to my patients that it's for MRIs, MRI purposes because we use a magnetically induced rod, which means that they are not compatible with MRIs. Uh, and also it's a specialty item. So God forbid the patient gets injured uh, out of state, out of country or, or somewhere else. Uh, people caring for your patient may not be able to have the tools to remove that, that rod. So that was the last special consideration of, of internal tibial lengthening. In conclusion, it's uh, internal lengthening, um, intramedial lengthenings are not just intramedial nailing and they are really limb lengthening. So they are um, distraction osteogenesis cases and, and protocols that have to be addressed the same way lengthening protocols are addressed with external fixation. The same considerations have to be taken into account, but modified to fit the internal reality. Planning is key. Measure twice, cut once. Um, sometimes measure three times or four times and cut once to make sure that, that, that as a surgeon, you'll be able to bring your patient to completion safely. The devil's in the details and careful follow-up is necessary. So thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, just a, a quick introduction to the Baltimore Limb Deformity course uh, that is at its 32nd annual iteration this year between August 24th and August 28th of 2022. We, uh, we welcome people from all over the world for uh, our course and everyone is welcome. And if you are, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for the fantastic talk. I mean, the depth of the subject and all the little things that you've pointed out are fantastic. And guys, uh, the Baltimore Limb Deformity course is one of its kind. It's the oldest deformity course that at least I know of. And everybody who has a chance to go there should go there. Michael, we are still having some problem with visas. So that is one thing to look out for. But I hope that... Uh, with the COVID situation improving, I mean, this should not be an issue. So the topic is now- If it's not this year, it can be next year. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sir. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, so no, if not this year, definitely next year, guys, please watch out for the Baltimore Limb Deformity course. And I invite our faculty for questions uh, on the subject. Yes, Dr. Michael. Wonderful presentation. Yes, Dr. Alta. Yeah, Thank I you. Congratulate congratulate you for that wonderful presentation and lightning one. And then I have a couple of questions in mind. That's number one. What is the maximum length uh, you achieve in tibia? So that question depends on the implant that is used. Most okay. 
internal lengthening uh, implants have a limit at eight centimeters. Uh, some lengthening implants have a limit that goes up to 10 or 12 centimeters. Yeah. Now, it depends on the indication. Uh, I, I tend to lengthen at, at a rate of five to six centimeters at a time. However, if we're talking about bone transport uh, with an internal nail, which are techniques that are a little different, uh, then we can go up to eight centimeters without a problem. And sometimes and it, may it may require more than one lengthening to achieve the appropriate length. Okay, how, uh, like, uh, at what level you would safely get a length that is not going to produce any equinus or any other contractures in the limb? So the classic, the classic uh, teaching of Elizarov is to, to make an osteotomy in the metaphyseal region, so very high up uh, below the tibial tubercle. Now, the problem is that it, it has a tendency to create a lot of deformities, apex anterior and valgus deformity. With an internal lengthening nail, this doesn't leave a lot of space at the top to allow good fixation, to allow blocking screws, and to prevent those deformities from occurring. So Dr. Robert Rosbrook has published on the topic and uh, states that uh, an osteotomy about 10 centimeters below the joint, below the, um, the articular surface, is the sweet spot to have a good regenerate, to have a regenerate that's not too atrophic, to have a canal that's uh, small enough to prevent too much deformities from occurring and have enough space above to put blocking screws laterally and posteriorly and achieve good lengthening. And it's high enough uh, at the soleus insertion to prevent uh, severe quinus of the ankle. However, I do recommend doing a, a either a gastrocnemius recession, uh, strayer type, or a volpius gastroxoleus recession, a little bit more distal, um, in, in the longer lengthenings, in the lengthenings of magnitude of, of five to six centimeters. I hope so that answers your question. Is, so my question is, if you have a reasonable small lengthenings, three to four or four to five centimeters, do you really, would you score higher on the intramedullary device than a simple external fixation, which has the versatility of managing any contractures, quince contractures, and doesn't have any intra-op difficulties? as would a nail uh, demand. It would need more meticulous nature. And I believe there must be good amount of radiations also involved during the procedure to have the precision, exact precision, which may not be that necessary in case of an external physician. If you, you had a complete to study. So it's a very good question. It's not a study that we have right now. The, the, uh, the fluoroscopy time or the amount of radiation for both uh, procedures, it would be very interesting to, to have actually, very, very interesting. Now, th those are very good questions. And uh, the same way we mentioned about the different methods of fixation for, for tibial plateau, um, the, the same applies to a tibial lengthening. If, if a surgeon is very experienced in external fixation lengthening and, and his patients can tolerate the pin sites and and tolerate the external fixation, then it's a very good tool in, in achieving the goals. In the United States and in Canada, in the West, patients are not as strong and as strong-willed as, as in India. And the idea of having an external fixator on their leg, even for three to four months for a smaller lengthening, three to four centimeters uh, or five months, it sometimes is it's too nerve-wracking. They would rather live with their deformity correction. The, both implants or, or external fixator will allow the same results. They will allow the same amount of length. They will uh, allow for correction of, of soft tissue um, contractures with the appropriate adjuncts. So with appropriate physical therapy, internal fixation and external fixation will be equal in results. Now, the, the patient reported outcomes during the lengthening, the, the, uh, the quality of life during the lengthening wearing the external fixator was inferior to the, um, to the quality of life during internal lengthening devices 
uh, just to the fact due to the fact that there is no fixator. Uh, so I think I think both are both are equal. Couple of more questions, if I'm not doing too much. So uh, in case of femur, would you prefer a proximal lengthening or a distal lengthening? Number one. And in case of a tibial lengthening, once you are using syndesmotic screws, do you have any breakages during lengthening? Do you have any issues with the syndesmotic screws? Very good question. So first question, in a, tibia, in a femur lengthening, what's better to lengthen proximal or distal? Um, if there is a concurrent deformity correction that has to be done um, of, the, of the valgus or, or varus type, or even apex anterior, the, the best course of action is to go where the deformity is, but very often it is distal at the femur, so a distal lengthening is preferred. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a little dog barking. Give me a quick second. Maggie. All right, so the, uh, when, len when lengthening distally at a femur, there is a lot more stretch that occurs through the vastus intermediate, which will tend to create a little bit more um, knee flexion contractures and knee, ex sorry, knee extension contractures or difficulty flexing the knee uh, during the lengthening. So for a pure lengthening yeah. without deformity correction, I personally prefer going in an integrate manner. The detractors of the integrate lengthening will say that it tends to, to, to displace the mechanical alignment laterally because we are lengthening through the anatomic axis rather than through the mechanical axis. What, I'm, what I answer to those people is that this is only a theoretical concern. We're actually publishing our data about it right now. We're writing them up. And there is a natural tendency for the implants to bend into varus during femoral lengthenings, internal femoral lengthenings that offset that lateral displacement. So, so it has not been an issue. So my, in ex my experience, I would always prefer a proximal lengthening because of the prevention of the knee contractures. It's quite comfortable. You get a good amount of soft tissue that uh, stretches between the proximal and the distal end. With the result, you don't have any contractures rather than in case of a distal lengthening. I completely agree with that, T totally. Now, sometimes it is not possible to lengthen proximally due to the morphology that, of the femur or due to the existence of the femur. Depending on the, I would say in case of a pure lengthening in a straight uh, femur, I would prefer to go for a proximal lengthening. T totally. Thank you. Much easier you for much. the patient. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, Michael. So I have a quick question for you. So when you talked of the syndesmotic fixation, and I mean, I saw this in Baltimore as well, you put your screws from the medial to lateral, whereas all the trauma surgeons will put it from the fibula to the tibia. So would you like to clarify why you do that? Why not lateral to medial? So if you, you, you it, the, um, the x-rays that I've shown, the fluoroscopy shots that I've shown uh, do not do it justice. So here's what I do. I insert, first a, an elizer of wire from the fibula to the tibia for the simple reason that it's much easier to go from a small target to a bigger target. And it, it allows me to, to, uh, to insert it dead center. Oh, and I forgot to answer Dr. Alta's question. I, we have not seen any fractures uh, through the syndesmotic fixation in tibial lengthenings. The main, I've seen twice, the uh, complication that I've seen twice was the syndesmotic screw backing out during the lengthening. Um, so that's it. So I insert the wire from lateral to medial. However, I do insert the screw from medial to lateral as it is a little less prominent, a little less symptomatic, uh, but this is just expert's opinion. Uh, I know there are, there are surgeons out there who will insert the screw from lateral to medial. Thank you, Michael, for that, uh, because uh, I did present one of the, uh, the internal lengthening, uh, so uh, lengthening over nail lectures, where I referenced one of Dr. John Herzenberg's articles. And the obvious question was why medial to lateral? So we have the answer to that question now. 
Thank it, you. it is purely for comfort. Yes. Okay. And my question to the faculty out here, Dr. Altaf, uh, Dr. Manish Prasad, Shamsul, how many of uh, us are using uh, the prophylactic anterior compartment fasciotomy? Because this is a big problem in the United States. And this is a very quick procedure. So I have seen this in the cadaveric workshop that they conduct at Baltimore. It takes about five minutes. It's fairly simple, very intuitive and easy to use. But how many of us are doing prophylactic anterior compartment fasciotomies out here? Not me. This is, in fact, uh, in fact, I wanted to ask Michael, why do you have to have so many prophylactic uh, this, uh, releases? Well, because the me, um, I, doctor I, like in past uh, two decades, I have done lots of lengthenings. I did not encounter this issue, especially if in case of a simple uh, this uh, Elizabeth lengthenings. I'll talk about the uh, intermedullary nails. Is it more in case of your intermedullary nails rather than in the conventional Elizabeth lengthening? So, what happens with an internal lengthening uh, nail is that we. A lot of hematoma. Well, there's a lot of hematoma, but first there is the uh, DeBastini technique that we use that creates hole through the back of the femur, uh, the back of the tibia, excuse me. And then to insert the, the nail, we have to ream the canal. And reaming the canal when the, uh, the osteotomy is, has already been started um, creates a lot of swerve, a lot of debris through the posterior compartment and sometimes even through the anterior compartment. Uh, and a lot of bleeding through it. So that's, that's one of the main reasons. Dr. Hertzenberg has published a case series where um, six patients developed a, um, a compartment syndrome after, um, after a tibial osteotomy. Now, I, I would be interested to see a study, and I think we'd have the numbers very easily, where we randomize the patients undergoing a tibial, a tibial lengthening in two groups, those with a prophylactic fasciotomy and those without it. And I think we can we could easily get very high numbers very quickly that would that would clarify the situation. Is it is the incidence of compartment syndrome statistically or clinically significant enough to warrant that extra that extra step? Um, another reason is the rate of complication after an internal uh, an inter fasciotomy that is done prophylactically through a percutaneous method, uh, the, 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 the rate of complication is very low and it only takes two minutes. So there's really not, not much to lose about it. So those are the ways to think about it. Thank you. Uh, may I come in, sir? Yes, sir, of course. Uh, sir, um, as far as uh, uh, anterior uh, fasciotomy, anterior compartment fasciotomy is concerned, uh, like I did my training under Dr. Ganger and Dr. Christoph Rader. I'm sure uh, I'm sure Dr. Michael knows them, and you also see that sir, uh, you're aware of them. So there were two things uh, which I was taught over there. Yes, uh, they used to consider this thing uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Michael just mentioned that uh, Dr. Hasenberg has produced papers which shows that there is a lot of uh, collection in the posterior compartment and all that. Uh, sir, conventionally we know that uh, just a fibulotomy or a fibulectomy itself is like doing a compartment uh, a release. When you go for a, a fib fibulotomy, you are actually treating a tight compartment. Uh, it's a part of uh, releasing the compartments in a case of compartment syndrome. In a case of uh, lengthening, internal lengthening, we are almost always doing that. Uh, in addition to the syndesmotic fixation proximally and distally. So that is one thing which they used to emphasize. The other thing which they used to do without fail was venting, sir. Before they used to do an osteotomy or reaming, they used to make multiple drill holes through and through uh, the tibia so that the intraosseous compartment uh, would not rise as much. And uh, 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 the, products, uh, the, the, the products would escape. So uh, that is one, sir. So uh, these were my views as Siddharth, sir. You asked whether we do an anterior uh, compartment fusion because I have done some fixator assisted uh, lengthenings using intramedullary nail, definitely not the precise and these uh, very, I have only seen these things uh, 
being done. So these are my views, sir. Sir. Yeah. Well, it's a straightforward procedure, and yes, I think they even have. I think uh, Michael. So I'm sure you have some of these videos on the internet that you can share because it's a very short, straightforward procedure. The only structure that I can think of at risk is the deep peroneal nerve. But if you are careful where you are going, um, you know, and it takes five minutes of your surgical time. And these uh, are never complications. So you don't want to see a compartment syndrome or a vascular injury. And if there is something that you can do about it, what's the harm? So that's True. my uh, sort of take on it. Absolutely right. Yes. So any other questions from our faculty members? Yeah, may I? Dr. Siddharth, may I? Yes, yes, Shamsul. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Michael and Dr. Alta for a wonderful talks. I was actually traveling, so I couldn't hear the whole talk. I just have one question. Besides the hysterectomy, I've been seeing in the cadaveric course, uh, perineal nerve release before lengthening or even uh, virus of ulcers corrections. But uh, as we all discussed, we are just doing uh, uh, fibula What is the takes on uh, uh, these cases for the, is it needed in all the cases or not? The perineal release. Very good question. So it will not be for all the cases. However, uh, a lengthening of the four to five centimeter magnitude will cause a lot of stretching of the lateral compartment and the interior compartment. And what that lateral compartment aponeurosis does as it, as it stretches and tightens, it becomes like a guillotine for the common perineal nerve around the fibular head where it, um, where it enters, enters the lateral compartment. And at the, inter, at, at the intercompartmental membrane, the intramuscular septum between the lateral and the interior compartment, the, the deep branch that, lie, that is right underneath can also become compressed. Uh, so it is very, very common that I, we get, I get patients who underwent lengthenings um, in, in other institutions where this is not routinely done, uh, come to our clinic with um, weakness of dorsiflexors, uh, allodynia in the, at the top of the foot and, and between the, at the first web space. And, and then postoperatively, per, by performing that, um, that common perineal nerve release, we solve the issue. So with historically with external fixation, it's much easier to release the nerve prophylactically before the external fixator is applied than if the common perineal nerve symptoms appear during the lengthening, then you have to do a release through a fixator. We have just basically extrapolated that to internal lengthenings to, um, to um, prevent this from happening during internal lengthenings. Um, so I'm a, I'm a firm believer in it because common perineal nerve palsy can be debilitating, completely debilitating and lead to drop foot. Um, one just has to, 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 to go on the online communities that are very, very um, savvy on lane lengthenings that are very interested in lane lengthening where they post informations about their cases to see that the incidence of, of common perineal nerve uh, policy and, and neuropathy is very high during tibial length. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot because I've been doing uh, lengthening over nail over Elizero and femur and uh, tibia both. And in a few cases, I have needed this perineal release only. Uh, not in all the cases. Uh, my question extends to Dr. Altaf Kausa, sir. In uh, tibial plaque fractures, there is a very good discussion in the groups about the spanning of the knee. So in how many cases, sir, do you feel the spanning is important, especially in the depressed fracture? And how many cases you don't feel the use of spanning? See, in my practice, I have been not using it very often. Right, so I, my indication would be if you have an... Uh, if you have a ligaments injury at all, or you have some aversions of the collateral ligaments, yeah. I would like to do it in the, those cases. Otherwise, I feel that I shouldn't come out unless I have got excellent congruence and excellent stability below the knee. So if I'm done with that, I will leave the femur. I will not go across. Perfect. And for the past two days, I hardly used it across the knee. Because my belief is that I don't want that. Uh, it's no not such a great thing that you ask the patient to bear weight next. Day. It's not mandatory. Why would one like to have uh, weight bearing only next day? Once you know that the fragments are so fragile, 
Yeah. So I prefer to have a motion rather than restricted across the Thank you, sir. Right. Even I've been not using spanning in most of the cases. One more thing, uh, yes, uh, weight bearing, I just allow uh, total test weight bearing next day only and, weight, and total weight bearing after two weeks only. And uh, uh, more that I've been using uh, five by eight rings in the uh, most of the table body fractures. That give a good stability if you use multiple U-pires. Of course, of course, you see, if you are not, if you are not, if you are having, like I showed, if you have a stable fractures, those type five or six, you might go with the five base with the, and the distal unipolar and fix it, a hybrid one. That I would it. love that, no issues with that. But I still, even if I have a best fixation, I would not allow my patients to have full weight bearing because mm -hmm. still the fragments are fragile, especially in those uh, high grade comminuted fractures. Right. I would not like them to have, because even if you did best, the medial collapse is very common. Try to prevent that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks both of you for a wonderful yeah. talk. Thank so you, do Dr. we have any, any more questions? I think there is one question from YouTube. Let me, let me just read that. It is from Dr. Shatish Rathor. Femur shaft fractures, proximal upper third with butterfly fragments. Not healing. What was the solution? It's about femur. It's not about the topic. You can leave it, sir. We can, leave it. we can discuss more about this when we have talks on non-unions yeah, and exactly, exactly. Uh, stuff like that. Thank you. So, guys, I think it's time to say goodbye to our two very, very experienced speakers, uh, Dr. Altaf, Dr. Michael Asayag. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for making these talks very, very interactive and informative. It has been an excellent learning experience for all of us. Thank you from Asami, India, to both of you. Thank you, Sadat. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Altaf. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Hoda. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks Dr. Prasad. And we Thank you, sir. We uh, are coming for AsamiCon, uh, coming to AsamiCon at Pune in June. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. With this, I'm stopping the live stream.